Good morning. Uh, so my, my job today is to really uh, to briefly summarize some research that we've been doing at Chapin Hall over almost 10 years now, uh, describing the transition to adulthood for foster youth. And one of the main implications of the study is that states might want to give some serious thought to extending foster care past the age of 18 if they haven't already done that. And so the passage of the Fostering Connections Act in 2008 that allows states to do that uh, is really a watershed uh, moment in the development of child welfare policy in this country. And uh, what I'm going to do is just share a little bit of data with you that um, tells what we know so far about the potential implications of allowing young people to remain in care uh, past age 18. So briefly, uh, the Midwest study, the full name is the Midwest Evaluation of the Adult Functioning of Former Foster Youth. And uh, the study represents the largest uh, prospective study of foster youth making the transition to adulthood um, in the wake of the uh, Foster Care Independence Act of 1999. And in fact, it was a collaboration between the states of Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin uh, that was in response to the, to the Foster Care Independence Act. The act called for states to collect outcome data through age 21 on youth aging out of care and at the time, the states wanted to sort of get ahead of the curve by collecting some data and kind of showing how that could be done. It took a long time for the federal government to actually implement those regulations. And this is actually the first year that states are collecting those data. But uh, Illinois, Iowa, and Wisconsin are fortunate enough to have the kind of data that, that the National Youth and Transition Database will ultimately provide for other states. The young people in the study uh, were still in care at age 18, had been in care for at least a year, so the states felt that they had some responsibility for and some ability to prepare them for adulthood. They had all been placed in care because of abuse, neglect, or dependency, not because of delinquency. And the data I'll be sharing with you today come from in-person interviews, although we are able to link the data to a variety of government uh, data resources. We started back in 2002-2003 with 732 young people, most of them in, in Illinois, given the size of the state. Very good response rates. You can, in fact, get young people in foster care to talk to you about their experiences. We're not the only ones to be successful in that regard. Uh, but we've been able to retain over 80% of that group uh, in interviews at age 19, 21, 23, 24. And we're not, we're going to be out of the field probably the end of this month, and we're already over 80% at age 26. So let me summarize uh, some early adult outcomes uh, that we know about from this study, and, and other studies generally confirm these results. Uh, outcomes are relatively poor across a variety of domains. What I mean by relatively, I could find that a lot of different ways, but one is, is compared to their peers. Uh, but also just compared, if you look at it from a policy standpoint, if the purpose of all this federal policy is to help young people have a reasonably successful transition to adulthood, a lot of the outcomes we observe um, are troubling. Uh, it's not to say that there aren't a lot of young people doing just fine, but, but too many of them aren't. So the trends are generally problematic, uh, declining engagement in education, and a much lower level of engagement in education than you see in the general population. Uh, gradually increasing but very poor engagement in the workforce. We never see more than about half the young people employed at any given point in time from 17 all the way through uh, 20, 23, 24. Lots of children, but also lots of non-resident children. So a lot of, you know, by, at age 19, a lot of them had children, but they were generally living with them. By 21 to 23, many more of them have children, and many of those children are living elsewhere, uh, generally with relatives, but some of them are living in state care. Troubling levels of justice system involvement, uh, over half the young men uh, being arrested, for example, between 18 and 21, um, and, and, and into the early 20s. The outcomes vary by gender. The young men are generally faring worse than the young women. Uh, but despite the sobering picture, many young people leaving the care of the state uh, do well. And the overall outcomes obscure a couple things. First of all, they obscure differences in the outcomes between Illinois and Iowa and Wisconsin. I'm going to talk about that. It's kind of the key issue here, policy. And secondly, the outcomes obscure differences between subgroups of young people. There are some groups of young people that sort of look similar in number of characteristics that are doing OK. And then there's some that are not doing so well. I'll mention that at the end of my talk. So what we have here in the Midwest studies, what, what us social scientists like to call a natural experiment. 
And that's a function of the fact that the ability of young people to remain in care differs between uh, Iowa and Wisconsin and Illinois. Illinois is one of the few jurisdictions still, even with the new law, where courts can and routinely do extend care and supervision until age 21. But during the study, Wisconsin and Iowa generally discharged youth before their 19th birthday. Very few were in care. Uh, I think there were one or two in Iowa out of 63 that were still in care past their 19th birthday, none in Wisconsin. And this, this graphic here illustrates the net effect of this policy difference. So if we were wondering whether our experiment is something we should look at, this graph I think makes a pretty good case that we should. What it shows is the magenta column is, is uh, Wisconsin, the next one kind of yellow is Iowa, and the, and the very light blue is Illinois. And it shows the percentage of young people in each state in my study who exited care at various ages, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. And what you can see is that in Wisconsin and Iowa, they're virtually the same. Um, some exit at 17, basically all the rest exited at 18. Um, whereas in Illinois, over half of the young people didn't exit till after the 20th birthday. And I started with them all at the same time, right? I mean, they've all been in care for a year, they're all in care at 17 and a half or so, and voila, huge difference in the extent to which they remain in care, having everything to do with state policy. And you can see at the bottom there, the average age at which young people uh, who are in care around the transition of adulthood leave in Wisconsin and Iowa is basically just a little bit under age 18, whereas the average age in Illinois is 20. So on average, young people in Illinois are spending two more years in care if they're at that point where they, they're reaching the age of adulthood. So without getting into all the fancy methods we use and different studies, we've, I'm going to put, summarize some findings here on uh, what we think the impact of extending care is. We think we have pretty strong evidence that allowing young people to remain in care until 21 increases their likelihood of pursuing post-secondary education, though I have to say uh, few of these youth as of age 23, 24 have a degree but lots of them who are, are able to stay in care, over a third have at least one year of college. And if you look at the benefits over, over the lifetime of even a year of college in terms of earnings, et cetera, that's, that's, a, that's a big deal. And we'll see at age 26 how many of them more have gotten a degree between 23 and 26. More qualified evidence, but we still think it's worth paying attention to, that allowing foster youth to remain in care until 21 is associated with increased earnings and delayed pregnancy, delay particularly between 17 and 19 which might not sound like a big deal, but when you kind of dig into these data, I, I would make a case that it's probably a good idea for most of these young people to not be having kids at age 17 um, or maybe even 19, given um, other things they need to do in their life in order to be able to parent uh, effectively. Extending care appears to delay homelessness, but not prevent it. We're still digging on the data there, but we definitely prevent homelessness by extending care, but it looks like whenever you, uh, you know, kind of back off and say to young people you're on your own, there's a rough patch there for six months or so. And then lastly, and this is entirely consistent with federal policy, allowing foster youth to remain in care until 21 significantly increases the likelihood of them receiving independent living services after the age of 19 or even after the age of 18. Uh, basically, if you look at the young people still in care, you look at the people in Illinois at 19, 21, and we ask them a series of questions. Did you get help looking for a job? Did you get help? Um, obtaining housing, etc. The young people in Illinois and young people remaining in care are much more likely to say they're getting those forms of help than the young people who left earlier. And the last thing I want to say, so just to summarize all that, um, what, what years ago people said, what's your biggest finding from the Midwest study? I'd say, well, the fact that the vast majority of young people, if given the opportunity, will in fact choose to remain in care after the age of 18, if circumstances are right. And in Illinois, uh, folks in Illinois, a lot of folks from Illinois in the room, still working on improving the system. Nobody here, I think, says we've got it all right. But we evidently have it right enough that the vast majority of young people choose to remain in state care voluntarily after the age of 18. Uh, that's a big finding. And then the other one is that appears to give young people opportunities that they otherwise don't have if, if the state basically says you're on your own at 18. Uh, but one thing I want to say, that because I, I think it's very important for implementing the Fostering Connections Act. So any state that's thinking, well, we're going to extend foster care to 21, or a state like Illinois has already extended foster care, I think would do well to look at the Midwest study, particularly an issue brief we have on what we call distinct subgroups of foster youth uh, at the point of transition to adulthood. Um, because we've identified four subgroups 
Uh, two of which are doing reasonably well, one we call accelerated adults. They've made a lot of transitions early. They've set up their households, they're working, they're, you know, on their own. Um, but, you know, they need more help with education, et cetera, but they're basically staying out of trouble. Another group we call accelerated adults, very much like the, uh, I'm sorry, we call emerging adults, very much like the group that Jeff Arnett, the developmental psychologist, describes as for this period in your 20s when you're experimenting with things. And these young people tend to be living with family or with others. Um, they're putting off marriage, putting off having kids, um, doing okay in school, probably need the same kind of supports that most young people in this transition age need. But the other two groups, I think, need a lot of help. One are struggling parents. They make up one quarter of the group. And they're struggling in the sense that they have very little education. Uh, they're relying on public assistance. They have lots of kids. Um, and their prospects, I think, aren't great for improving their lot or the lot of their children without a lot of help. And then the last group we call Troubled and Troubling that probably needs significant intervention for many years with a range of psychosocial problems. They've got mental health problems, substance abuse problems, lots of engagement with the adult justice system. Uh, so I think we need to think of implementing policy not in a one-size-fits-all manner. So with that, I will turn it over to Miller. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Our second speaker is Miller Anderson of the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. Good morning, everyone, and to all of us who are watching us or listening to us this morning. Uh, I want to first start by ditto in everything that Mark said, because one of the things that we have found in Illinois, uh, and because we have been at it for a while, that we've had a lot of trial and error lessons in, in developing our programs. What I want to kind of talk about, and, and is a little historical perspective, as I was asked to kind of talk about Illinois to all of the folk who are out there who know who aren't doing programs, I thought looking at our own history would be kind of interesting and I kind of got bogged down in it, but I'm going to fast <laughs> forward it a little bit. Um, we were looking at, uh, we had always had, even back in the early 80s, looking at trying to address services through our PAL program. Some of those who've been around uh, remember hearing that term where we were actually working, we had case managers and folks trying to start some early work with young people in all forms of care. And somewhere between 1989 and 1996, our system blew up and our focus tended to be more on bringing kids into care than really looking at focusing on moving kids out of care. And around 1998, 1999, we began to refocus on the fact that we have a large population of youth who were basically 19, 20, and 21 exiting care. And many of them, as Mark's study would show, uh, had uh, a lot of issues, particularly around education or, or lack of educational attainment. Uh, and so with that, we began to look at developing programs. Uh, oddly enough, we looked at developing independent living programs first, which I didn't know until I was doing our homework, uh, which probably was not the smartest idea looking back 11 years from now, because many of our young people that we serve who are our wards were, would, I would say, would fall in that very troubled youth category. And so many of them were not ready for independence. There was a boatload of services and needs they had prior to, I think, moving out of our system that we were beginning to look at and actually develop transitional living programs around 2001 and 2002. And what we've tried to do in those programs and evolved them over the last 10 years is to really build in services and supports really a high focus around education. Uh, one of the things that we've learned, and I'm going to reference back to a lot of the data that not only Mark has done, that we viewed at Chapin Hall, we actually have uh, looked at and done a study in terms of what do our youth look like at the age of 18? What have been their experiences within the child welfare system? And, and the data that we look at that kind of guides our thought today is, is fairly astronomical, and I'll share it, because I think states ought to take a look at it. You know, what the Chapin Hall study that Andy and them were involved in showed that at age 18, the majority of our youth had been in care on average 10.8 years. And that during that period of 10.8 years, they had been in, on average, seven different placements. And so as we look at our youth who we would call, who, who have troublesome histories, the, the issue of trusting adults, uh, having stability in their lives have had a very dramatic impact on their ability to basically move toward independence. 
We also know that because of a lot of the instability in care, it has had a profound impact on the, on the young people's educational achievement. And so we have been troubled in our state, particularly looking at the data, because data does not lie, at the fact that a large number of our kids were actually coming out of care and basically ending up homeless. And so we have been focusing, and I think all states will have to look at that. I think we've learned that the average 18-year-old, unless they are exceptionals, are not ready to live independently, even though we have uh, in our policies discharged kids. But there have been some unique things that we've done um, to kind of address that. Um, in Cook County, for example, we've been working very closely for years with the court and also the Office of the Public Guardian in doing a unique idea around benchmarking where we actually kind of have a team concept where the, the judge and Judge Martin implemented that, the, uh, the guardian, our workers will basically engage the young people in really counseling and planning and assisting the young people in, in helping making very good career choices. Um, we have developed um, transitional living programs where young people at age 17 and a half, and these are young people who have primarily been in residential treatment, group home care, uh, have an opportunity to move out of those restricted forms of care to begin to really look at a more normalizing community experience. And we also recognize to do that there's a lot of, of basic needs that young people have to transition out of a structured residential care to go into a community setting. Um, we work hand in hand with the court on that because oftentimes because of the history many young people just want to get out of the system. And unfortunately, in large parts of our state, in the 100 counties outside of Cook, routinely young people have been discharged at age 18 and 19, and the vast majority of them are not ready to live independently. Another policy change that we made uh, last year, with the help of a lot of our advocates here in Illinois, was we came up with a new law, uh, although I don't like the name of the law. It's called trial discharge. But basically what trial discharge is, I call it House Bill 4154. And what it basically allows is for emancipated youth who are under the age of 21 who have gone out, been emancipated, and have failed, uh, not been able to find uh, employment, may have lost housing, who are really in dire straits, they have the opportunity to come back into care. And we actually have been working over the past year of developing protocols with the court in terms of bringing the young people back, working with them as partners in terms of developing uh, placement resources and kind of a youth contract to really help them basically work through uh, those issues to try to prepare them for adulthood. Our focus in our transitional living, independent living programs, and we really have gone to a performance-based model which is still fairly new, is to work with our private providers who provide uh, the housing services and the support services to really focus on outcomes. And the major outcomes that we're going to be focusing on now and going forward is really looking at stability educational outcomes. And we have a new one called discharge with potential. We used to use in our policy guide the whole notion of making you self-sufficient. But the reality is when we look at today's economy, we know that we cannot guarantee every youth uh, employment uh, once they emancipate. But we believe by focusing on helping our young people get GEDs if they don't have GEDs, helping them to focus on looking at other vocational opportunities if it's not uh, a, a four-year institution, to really have some skill sets so at age 21, 22, 23, they're able to at least compete. Uh, in the marketplace. Uh, I guess my closing point that I'll have, because 12 minutes is pretty tight, uh, would also be one of the things that Illinois has done in, in our partnerships, even with the community colleges, once our young people are able to complete uh, alternative school education or even GED, uh, they have an opportunity to actually go to the community colleges. And because they are wards of our state, they can actually go to community college, basically tuition free. We've been using a lot of our Chafee dollars over the years to really focus primarily on educational outcomes through our education and travel voucher programs, uh, our youth and college programs. And so our hope is, is, because we've been doing this for a long time, 
that we may be able to claim some of those dollars through the 4E that will allow us to put those back into programs to only strengthen our programs and services for our young people. So uh, that's kind of my 12 minute version. <laughs> Thank you, Miller. Next, we'll turn to Angie for a California perspective. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, as Matt said, my name is Angie Schwartz. I'm the policy director at the Alliance for Children's Rights, which was one of the co-sponsors of California's Fostering Connections to Success Act, which is also known as AB 12. And AB 12 is California's recently enacted legislation that opted into the Federal Fostering Connections to Success Act that Dr. Courtney referenced, which gave states the option of extending foster care until 21, and also another option, which California has also taken, of converting our existing subsidized guardianship program into now a federally subsidized guardianship program. So I was asked to discuss briefly today both how California went about passing AB 12 and also to discuss some of the challenges that we're facing now in this enormous redesign of a system that, until now, has routinely discharged youth at 18. And under AB 12, starting in January, those youth will now have the opportunity to remain in care until age 21. So I thought I'd start with just a little background on California's foster care system. And I like to call this slide the, if California can do it, anyone can do it, because <laughs> We had dual challenges, really, in enacting AB 12. Um, we have a bit of a fiscal crisis in our state, a $21 billion deficit, and combine that with the fact that we have the largest foster care population in the country and the largest number of young people aging out of care, 5,000 on average aging out every year. I think New York is the next highest uh, numbers of youth aging out at about 1,500. So, Given those challenges, how did we manage to pass AB 12? Um, a few things. We built off the momentum of the federal law passing. So the Federal Fostering Connections to Success Act passed in October 2008, and AB 12 was introduced in December of that same year. So we really built off that momentum. We also had a very strong and diverse group of co-sponsors backing AB 12. There were nine co-sponsors of the bill, and collectively we represented the courts, the minors' attorneys, the social workers, the counties, uh, child and youth advocates, um, the foster care and group home providers, and we all worked intensively together over two years to really draft the language and the amendments of AB 12 to educate the public and media and really build support for the policy. Third, and really this point cannot be overstated, we relied on the research that Dr. Courtney talked about. We cited the Midwest study extensively in briefings, at hearings, in our testimony, and having that evidence of what it meant in terms of improved outcomes to youth who were able to stay in care, combined with the fact that we had so many young people exiting care, really helped make the case for why we needed to pass this important piece of legislation. Another factor is we have a really uh, active presence of foster youth in our legislature. The California Youth Connection, and in general, we have a very large presence of youth. Every member of our legislature was visited by current or former foster youth multiple times as AB 12 was pending. They testified, they held uh, events at the Capitol, and their voices and stories were tremendously important. And all of that resulted in really having really broad bipartisan support for this legislation. But given that fiscal crisis, it wasn't enough to have a really strong coalition and support for the policy, which we all agreed was a good policy. We really had to address the fiscal issues and the fiscal crisis that the state was facing and make the case for why this policy was worth the investment at this time. So we did that in a few ways as well. First, we linked the conversion of our existing KinGap program, that subsidized guardianship program, um, to the extension of foster care. So under the Federal Fostering Connections to Success Act, we now had the ability to draw down federal funds for a program that we had been funding with state-only dollars 
for over a decade, and AB 12 did both of the two policy reforms together, so it created that revenue source for the extension of care from the savings that were realized from drawing down new federal dollars for the subsidized guardianship program. And going back to the evidence again, we were fortunate enough that Dr. Courtney and his colleagues, Amy Dworsky and Clark Peters, also here at Chapin Hall, uh, conducted a California-specific study that showed that California would real, realize real savings from this investment. $2.40 for every dollar invested um, was the finding of that study. And we used that as well to say, this is worth it. This is why we need to make this investment at this time. And it was incredibly persuasive with our policymakers. And then we also looked at where we were already spending state money on this group of young people who had aged out of foster care. And in California, we'd had a transitional housing program called THP Plus for a long time. And we had been making significant state investments uh, into that program and realized that we could now, by having that be part of AB 12 and another way of serving these young people, leverage additional federal funds as a result of that investment. And so that was also a good fiscal reason to take advantage of this new opportunity. And in addition, we had to make several fiscal compromises, of course. So one thing we did was give ourselves time in implementing AB 12 so it doesn't take effect until January 1, 2012, although as I sit here in May of 2011, it doesn't feel like we gave ourselves any time at all. But the impact of that was that there was no appropriation in the year that AB 12 was passed. We also have phased in implementation. So January 1, 2012, Benefits are extended until 19, then January 1, 2013, until 20, and that final extension to 21, which can't happen until 2014, also isn't guaranteed to happen at this point, because AB 12 says the legislature needs to take further action in order to extend foster care for that final year from 20 to 21, again, as a fiscal compromise. We also limited group home placements which obviously makes sense from a fiscal perspective because group homes are very costly, but it also made sense from a policy perspective because group homes are also very restrictive placements and our goal is to allow youth to have incremental levels of responsibility and less restrictive placements. We also made some compromises with the THP Plus foster care program in terms of keeping it within our existing capped allocation and we're undergoing a process now to set new rates for that placement setting. So that's how we got AB 12 passed during tough fiscal times. And I'm going to switch gears now and discuss a little bit about the framework of AB 12 and what we're really trying to accomplish through this reform. And this slide and also a couple of handouts that you have in your folder, which are posters um, that are the core values of AB 12, really summarize what we're trying to accomplish with this policy, which is to allow these young adults increasing opportunities for autonomy incrementally greater levels of responsibility in order to really develop the skills necessary to leave care as independent adults. And this slide is some examples of some aspects of AB 12 that demonstrate the way that we're trying to carry out that goal and affect those core values. And I think also some of the unique aspects of what we've done in California's approach to extended foster care. The first, the mutual agreement, is really the first document that makes that transition from being a minor in dependency to now being a non-minor and really changes the dynamic of foster care. We intend it to be that first document that says, you have a voice in this process, you're a partner in this process, and you're volunteering to remain in foster care. Here's what you can expect as a result of volunteering to remain in foster care. Here are the rights and responsibilities you have. Here are also what the agency is obligated to do on your behalf and use that as a way to start to change the dynamics of foster care for these young people. Second, we have a new placement option. It's called Supervised Independent Living Placement. It's one of the options under the Federal Fostering Connections to Success Act. And it is in, in addition to other places that these non-minors could live that are more familiar to all of us, like foster family homes or with relative caregivers. But the SILPs are really kind of a radical shift in some ways from traditional foster care because they can encompass a really large variety of living settings, like a college dormitory or university housing or an apartment with roommates who maybe or maybe are not in the foster care system, room and board situations, renting a room from a relative. And what we're really 
working on now in our meetings and implementation is both how to ensure that these really diverse range of placements still meet health and safety standards, which they're required to make to meet, and also how we're going to assess a young person's readiness to live in a highly independent living setting, such as a supervised and independent living placement, but um, recognizing that we want to give them the opportunity to make these decisions on their own behalf, to give them the same experiences that all of us and that young adults have at 18 and 19 and trying out different living settings, but to do that within the construct of the foster care system. Um, another example of something uh, unique and another way that we're trying to really make the distinction between minors and non-minors is changing the nature of the dependency proceeding. So once these youth turn 18 and are no longer minors, their parents are no longer parties to the hearing, they're no longer noticed, and the nature of that attorney-client relationship also changes. So before they turn 18, the attorney is obligated to act in the minor's best interest, but after 18, they now act in the non-minor's behalf. So that dynamic changes as well. Uh, fourth, the reentry provisions um, of AB 12 are similar to what Miller was saying has recently been acted here in Illinois. We call it trial independence instead of trial discharge, but it's the same concept, which is, I don't know if it's a better name, but um, it gives... It's a better name. It's a better name. <laughs> Uh, it gives the young people who uh, maybe decided 18, I don't want to continue in extended foster care, so they would be put on trial independence um, and allowed to come back at any point that they decided that they, in fact, do want the support of the foster care system and allows young people to make that choice and to change their mind as many times as they want as long as they meet participation conditions. And finally, AB 12 also applies to youth in the juvenile justice system. So those youth who are either in a probation placement that's in foster care and also those youth that crossed over from dependency into the delinquency system and gives those young people also an opportunity to receive the support of the foster care system from 18 to 21. And we're actually working on language currently to allow those youth to have their status changed before they turn 18 so that they're not adjudicated delinquents, but rather they would have an adjudication of a transitional youth age status so that they don't have that stigma of being in the delinquency system as they're deciding whether or not to take advantage of this program. So I thought I would just end by summarizing some of the challenges and opportunities that we're facing in California as we attempt to implement AB 12. Our first is getting the program in place by January 1, 2012. But the opportunity there is it's really involved a massive effort by the state and the counties and the co-sponsors and brought us all together. We're working very hard to come up with all the policies and procedures that will govern this new program to vet those with all of the many stakeholders that are involved in the process and to work between the multiple systems that have to be reformed to accommodate these changes like eligibility and automation and social work practice and outreach and training and then all the different agencies like probation and the courts and the county, 58 county child welfare agencies and of course all the state agencies as well. And as we do that work, we're very mindful of the fact that we're trying to affect a culture change. We're trying to develop policies that really allow young people the opportunity to benefit from this extended time in care by having greater chances for responsibility, by getting to experiment and take on new challenges, and to view foster care and their participation in extended foster care as a safety net that's there to support them and not a system that they're trying to escape from. And one of the areas where that culture change has really been evident and where you can really see uh, what that means is as we try to define these eligibility standards. So under the federal law and of course under state law now, a youth has to be doing one of five things in order to participate in extended foster care. And defining what that means and how they would meet that participation standard um, has been somewhat of a challenge because we want to ensure that as many young people as possible can participate in the program and take advantage at wherever they're at at the time, but also have a program that really leads to these improved outcomes for young people. So, for example, with regard to the post-secondary education eligibility requirement, is, does that mean one class is enough to meet it, or should it be something more like half-time enrollment? And where we've settled at the moment is allowing youth who are doing half-time enrollment to be determined to meet the post-secondary education requirement, 
but those youth that are doing something less than that to be determined to meet the requirement that allows a youth to be participating in activities that remove barriers to employment. So in that way, we captured all of both populations of youth, and what we're, our goal is to design practice standards that really have social workers engaging with youth in both of those situations and encouraging them to achieve as much as possible. Um, I think the greatest test of whether we're going to succeed in these efforts is going to be whether or not we're successful in persuading the young people in California to take advantage of this new legislation. So that is still before us, and we'll see what happens in January of the new year. But it's a good segue uh, to a priest who is talking about the youth perspective. So thanks. Thank you, Angie. Our final perspective is the perspective that matters the most, those of the youth in care or recently in care. So on January 1st of my first full year as a truly independent person, my car broke down 100 miles outside of Tulsa, which is where I was living at the time, working for the National Resource Center for Youth Development. Lights flash once, twice, and the speedometer hit zero. I tearfully and fearfully called a friend who not only drove the hour and a half to come get me, but called a tow truck and waited for me until it arrived. Almost $800, and only 24 hours later, I had it back. It broke down again the next day. <laughs> I called my boss, letting him know I'd called a tow truck, but didn't know how I was going to get to work. He said he'd send one, send someone to pick me up. $250, and a few hours later, it was fixed. I was really excited. But I'm superstitious enough to believe that bad things come in threes. So when my car broke down again, two days later, I was ready. This time, I immediately called a tow truck, arranged a ride with a co-worker, Googled, for, Googled car problems, and Googled car problems matching my symptoms. When I was quoted $600 by the mechanic, I argued and eventually was quoted a more reasonable $350. I picked it up a few hours later, and though I was almost $1,800 poorer, the car was as good as a 97 Ford Taurus can be. <laughs> now... I'm not just here to tell a story. I mean, it is my primary role, but I really want to give you the foster youth perspective. Um, well, the foster youth perspective on the needs for and benefits of extending foster care to 21. Others have talked to you about implementation, policy, all of these amazing things, but I want to tell you what it really means. I'm not a foster kid anymore. That is probably clear. I was for 13 years, but now I'm halfway through a graduate program for my master's in social work. And I'm speaking to you as a success story, as one of those exceptional youth. I am speaking to you as a graduate level social work student, as a veter veteran advocate for youth, for foster youth, and a former child welfare worker. From those protect perspectives, what a perspectives, what an extension of foster care means is education, employability, self-advocacy, finances, and connection with a supportive adult. If you look at my story, a number of things should shine out. First, that my process was progressive. I started knowing, I had no idea what to do. I mean, I'm sitting 100 miles outside of Tulsa in a car <laughs> with lights flashing and a battery dying, and I just didn't know what to do, so I called someone. I had someone to call. I had access to money, and I'm sure if I hadn't had the money in my bank account, I would have been able to have someone give that to me. I was fortunate enough to have an employers that understood and, in fact, supported my status as a foster youth. Not every person has that, and that made a huge difference. I also had the ability to learn. There's something in education that says by the eight, by the third grade you learn to read and after that you read to learn. It's the same way for, for life in general. Until about 18, you're really just figuring it out. Like you're just figuring out life itself. And after that, you're starting to figure out what you can do to make a life. And so by extending foster care to 21, you're really giving youth an opportunity to practice life. I mean you to practice being an adult, to try and be an adult. So, da 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 da. Yeah. The really important aspect of this, and I am not going to speak for 12 minutes because I think that really that's all that matters, but the really important thing that I want to get across is if I was missing one component, if I had not had someone on the other end of that phone, if I hadn't had the money, if I hadn't had an understanding employer, I wouldn't necessarily be here today. And I don't mean that to be as dramatic as it sounds, but there's an element of truth to it. Remember that I am an exceptional youth. 
or I was an exceptional youth and I'm called an exceptional young adult or whatever you want to call it. But what if I was missing that? What if I hadn't had that? And what if I was just your average Joe without someone on the other end of the call or the under, other end of the phone? So just what the Extending Foster Care to 21 does from a foster youth, foster youth perspective is it gives them a chance to make a mistake, have someone teach them, learn from it, make the same mistake again, and do something differently. And that really, really, really is going to make all the difference. Thank you. Thank you. So for the rest of our time, we would like to engage in a conversation with the audience and among the panel. Um, so I will first start with a question that came to us from one of our web audience members previously to the panel while folks in the room think about questions that they might have for the panel as well and ask that any of the panel members who would like to respond to the question do, the, do that. So the first question is one really about <clears throat> the variation in the population all the way from a treatment specialized foster care to the exceptional youth who uh, is really very ready, very willing to take up any opportunity that comes along and will be successful for it. And the question is one of whether the invitation to take up among more challenged youth is really happening. Uh, some evidence uh, cited in the question from a study that found that an attempt to extend care for treatment foster and specialized foster youth did not lead to much take up of that invitation. And then how to think about the costs associated with that variation, that both youth who need a lot of specialized care cost a lot, and youth who are exceptional and take up a lot of services, take advantage of things cost a lot, but how are we thinking about uh, the middle group as well. So I don't know uh, who on the panel might want to begin that. I'll take a, a small stab at that. You know, I, in, in Illinois, any youth who's part of our system is eligible. And so we are not looking at making a distinction based on uh, a youth's behavior, but really looking at how we can provide those services to help them manage those behaviors. And I'll give an example. A lot of the young people that are in our transitional living programs, many of them, as I stated earlier, come from residential and group, group placements. And so those young people have gone in because they have had what we would call to manage some type of, of disease state. You know, we sometimes look at issues of, of children being different than adults. And so if an adult is bipolar, you know, if an adult has high blood pressure, some issues, we have to learn how to manage that and still go forward with our lives. And so literally with our young people, we have to work in our programs to help them manage control of those issues, which, we, which is a challenge. But also at the same time, work with them toward um, moving toward independence. I think the reality that we try to build in our programs and with our providers, that there is a sense of urgency that this is the last stop. You know, we can talk about what may have happened the first 5, 10, 15 years in care, but we have a very short window to really try to work with young people to hopefully that the trial and error that uh, that she mentioned, that they it will begin to kick in. But, you know, I think through program planning, uh, service planning, I think involvement of the adults, involvement of the courts, involvement in our whole team approach, you know, kind of keeps us on that track. I can say a little bit, um, again, it's restricted to what we've learned in, in Illinois. and um, We wondered that as well, actually, early in the study, uh, were the young people who were staying in care, partly because when I started sharing results saying staying in care is associated with good things like going to school, the immediate response of the skeptics was that's just because the ones who are going to stay in school are the ones that stay in care. And I, I guess to make a long story short, I've come to conclude that that's, that's really just not true. I mean, and there's, there's a couple of ways to, to get at that. One, the over 80% of the young people in Illinois who we start at 70 are still in care after 19, right? So it, it, it's a, actually unusual for young people to leave. And then when we look at the data, we have, we have a lot of data in the Midwest study that characterizes young people in terms of mental health problems and where they are in school and their closeness to family, et cetera. Um, actually, one of the folks that was mentioned earlier, Clark Peters, who, who was at Chapin Hall for a long time, 
worked with me to look at this question of who stays in care. And we found that system factors actually had a lot more to do with it than, than the characteristics of individual youth. And I, Miller mentioned that outside of Cook County, young people are more likely to be discharged. It doesn't appear to be because they want to be discharged, it's the function of courts and, and so on. The one place I would say, and this is I think instructive for making systems that are inclusive, we did find a weak relationship between substance use or substance abuse back when they were 17 and the likelihood of not staying in care. Well, why might that be the case? Well, maybe because the scrutiny associated with staying in care, if you want to use, maybe you're going to be more likely to leave. It wasn't a huge thing. It didn't account for much of the variation in staying. And the other thing we found is that for young people who were not in kinship care, closeness to family, if they were really close to family, they were slightly more likely to leave. Um, well, that makes sense too, right? I mean, if you feel like you have a place to go. Um, but I think the way to deal with these issues is, is to think about the fact that they're adults. I and mean, I think this thinking about, okay, you're using, you're using, but you're an adult, so how are we going to work with you around that, as opposed to treating you like a kid? So, and, and the issue with family is, if they can go with family, and that's where they'd rather be, and that's working for them, fine. But you want to have the ability for them to decide, well, that didn't work out, right, and come back. So I think that, in general, the idea that young people with challenges, whether it's behavioral emotional problems or parenting, by the way, I think we need to think about the extent to which our systems are friendly to parents. Because remember, the minute you're an adult, it may not be a great option, but if you're a low-income person, you can go on TANF and get food stamps. I mean, you can get some support and not have to deal with the child welfare system at all, right? So I think it's more a function of how thoughtful we are about the fact that we're dealing with young adults and in encouraging and empowering them to be involved. And if we do that, I don't think there'll be much of a relationship at all between these, these challenges that young people have and whether they stay in care or not. Angie, did you want to add to that? I mean, I would just say that that's exactly the approach we're taking in California as we address these issues. And what Dr. Courtney was saying is exactly what we're trying to do. And it goes to my point about eligibility standards versus practice standards and trying to make those eligibility standards very inclusive. They're a floor. They allow everyone to come in. And then the practice and how we engage those youth is, is what they get as a result of that time in care, but not having policies that force youth out or don't allow all youth to participate no matter where they're at. So that is the approach that we've taken so far in California as we design these policies. And then quickly, we all know that the level of education, and I'm just going to touch on the last part, the higher the le your level of education, the more money you make, which means the more money you contribute to taxes or whatever, whatever. But if you don't have a place to sleep at night, you can't really focus on education. So by extending foster care to 21, you give youth a higher chance of really just knowing that they're safe enough to plan their future. Great. Uh, questions from here in the audience, if you could wait a second for a microphone to appear and uh, uh, state your name and uh, affiliation uh, if you can. Uh, I'm Pam Cook. Uh, I'm a licensed clinical social worker right now just doing some consulting work uh, for Jobs for Youth. Um, Angie, <laughs> the this sounds great, uh, This uh, the program in California and about uh, trying on adulthood and the ability to for the kids to, to feel more like adults. Um, on the ground, transitional living in Illinois uh, is very much uh, like foster care in that it's it's very much based on, um, or can be at most times, risk management. Uh, so what what we tend to do, I think, is not be able to make that switch from foster care ch young children to children in care beyond the age of 18. Uh, it's, it, it, the risk is still there, uh, of, you know, for the agencies. And I think that informs their work a great deal more than the other perspective, which is you're an adult now, your decisions, your choice. Uh, how do you get that culture shift uh, to happen? Right. I, I think that's a great question, and it's certainly something that comes up in almost every meeting we have, and we meet every single week <laughs> to design uh, this new program. But the thing that's really encouraging about what we're doing in California is everyone has 
that awareness and the need to be mindful and cognizant of that as we're developing this pol these policies. And what comes up over and over again as we sort of raise the risk management perspective is saying, yes, but these are young adults. And we are trying to design a program that lets them be young adults and lets them make mistakes and lets them do things that we ne wouldn't necessarily want them to do without risking being ejected from foster care or without having some punitive approach to this system, which is really intended to be a safety net. So all of the policies that we're designing are really trying to respect that these are now adults and that they have the right to act like other young adults of the same age and trying to find ways to mitigate against what you're talking about and provide some assurance um, in terms of, you know, the backlash on the agencies because, of course, the counties and the state all have that concern over what's going to end up in the newspapers, <laughs> you know, the first time a youth makes a mistake. But I think that it's nice to see so many people, including the counties, including the state, including the social workers who share this perspective, who get how important that is, who understand that we have to be committed to this culture change if we really want this program to work for young people. And so I don't have a complete answer to your question because we're not done designing the policies, we're not done writing all of the rules, but but what we are doing is really trying to keep that issue at the very top of our agenda. It's why we created those posters that I've shared with all of you because we really want that to be front and center in everyone's mind as we design what the rules are and then as we carry it out so that every time that issue is raised we say, right, but these are young adults and this system is now serving young adults. So, Miller, did you add anything to that? You know, I think the, the biggest challenge to the point you raised in terms of the, the risk management, and I don't know if risk management is the right word, the unique challenges of trying to run community-based programs where you have to deal with, with landlords and people who are not in our field who aren't always as tolerant of the kinds of things that our youth might do as we would in the child welfare field. And, and I think that's the biggest challenge. Um, where we see where there are programs that we contract with that own their own facilities, you know, or dependent upon their ability to have good insurance. You know, we have less issues, we have less landlord issues. There's a community education piece that has to be ongoing when you run programs that are community-based setting for adolescents because one, we know older adolescents are discriminated against across the board, whether you're in care or not. And, and our population is, is not viewed as just you know, kids in care, but they're viewed as that that group, that, that teenage group. And we have many folks that are very fearful of our kids, you know, and, and there are probably reasons that we've given them in some cases to be that way. But to me, it's an ongoing uh, educational piece that we have to look at and working beyond the child welfare borders with the young people. Great. Next question. Again, if you could state your name and affiliation. Hi, um, my name is Ashley Piper. I'm the Director of Health and Human Services Engagement uh, with Bronner Group, a national consulting firm located here in Chicago. Um, my question is kind of more complementary to um, the legislation that Andy, Angie had proposed or talked about. Um, some of the clients that I work with, and forgive me if like I'm not as up on um, some of the legislation, are really interested in getting supplemental nutrition assistance benefits for um, their for their youth who are still in care. Um, and I was wondering if anything legislatively has changed around that. I know California had certain kind of localized movements around that as well as Florida. And I didn't know if there were any changes because it's it seems to be kind of a complement to um, staying in foster care longer and being able to free up public funds so that they can be attributed to other other things to enhance programs for youth who are um, extending or electing to be in care longer. I honestly don't know exactly what the interplay is with the SNAP benefits and the extended foster care. I think it may be that because foster care payments include paying for food, clothing, shelter, uh, and it's delineated in federal statute what the benefits are to cover, that it may be that you aren't able to receive both, although I'm not positive if if that's true. Um, and you're right, there were some efforts in California to uh, make easier access to those benefits for youth before we had a program in place that also had extended foster care. But I don't, I don't know the exact interplay between those issues. Sorry. <laughs> 
thing any of you else can add to that. Okay, go ahead. Good morning. Um, my name is Christine Nickpon, and I am a case manager with the UCAN agency, and I work with pregnant and parenting teens, which are that age group between the ages of 16 and 20. I'm also an SSA student with the University of Chicago, and I have an internship with La Casa Norte. So my question is about homelessness. We've heard that in this discussion, I'm experiencing that because I do work with youth that are between the ages of 18 and 24 that are experiencing some form of homelessness. So what are we doing programmatically to meet the needs of our youth when, we, when most of the programs that we refer our youth to require a GED or high school diploma when realistically we know that our youth are not obtaining those educational milestones? What are we doing to meet the needs of the other population that are parenting teens or that have other systemic barriers against them? Oh, that's a good question. I, I think we're doing, you know, part of what I think we, we're doing, we're doing all of the things to try to get them there. And I know your program is one that's putting forth the effort. I'm not going to let her off the hook. She's one of our providers. But, you know, part of it, I think, is going to boil down to how can we get young people motivated? Because, you know, it's between the ears. You know, there is no way, and, and I know when we talk about working with young people and getting them ready, you know, that the responsibility ultimately is going to have to kick in. For some, it kicks in at 19. Some don't get it until they're 30. And hopefully some of us get it. But I think what we can try to do is to really work with young people to help them. But again, a lot of it is going to have to deal with, again, motivation. I know the, it's not from lack of effort, you know. But I also know that a lot of our young people bring a lot of challenges when they come into our programs. And so the ability to engage them you know, to build a level of trust often takes longer from some kids to the next. And, and I'll go back to our Chapin data. When our kids are coming in at age 17 and a half and 18, they, in some cases, have had 10 years of failure with us already. And so how do we uh, build on that and try to, within a window of about two and a half years, you know, build a level of trust to motivate them? And I think by, you know, us looking at focusing on having more mentoring programs, you know, I think that we have to also begin to look at how can we get successful young people to connect with young people because sometimes it ain't always the policy makers or the, the social workers or even the clinicians. I think sometimes just having a role model or a family member or someone may play just a significant role as the roles that we play. Um, I want to. I want to use that question as an opportunity to reframe things a little bit. So one issue is how well do we do a good job, how do we, we support young parents, right? Folks who become parents between 16 and 20, let's say. I mean, the reality is they can stay in care till they're 21 um, in, in, in uh, DCFS care and in, in California, hopefully, assuming that the law is extended, that will be true as well. That's a very important question. How do we meet the needs of those young people while they're in care and hopefully help them parent their children? Another question, though, is to what extent do our policies and practices engage with young people around the decision to get pregnant? Uh, is that a decision or not? We could, we could have a nice discussion about that. But uh, the behaviors engaged in getting pregnant, and then whether you decide to have a child. And it's a touchy subject. but. Um, you know, our research, it's already public, our research that, that, that says that extending care is associated with a pretty significant reduction. I think it's about 38% reduction in the likelihood of pregnancy between 17 and 19. This is a personal choice, but in terms of the outcomes we observe, I would say that's a good policy. Decreasing the likelihood that these young women are going to get pregnant between 17 and 19. And we, we don't have enough data to say much about the behavior of the young men just because of the way we did the study. Uh, it's our bad. but. Hopefully, we're not encouraging them to get people pregnant during that period of time. The other thing that is going to be presented publicly later today at a conference on reproductive health at the University of Chicago is that we find that young people in care are much more likely to terminate their pregnancies than young people who have left care. So I'll leave it to you to determine whether you think that's good or not. I mean, that's a policy that I was going to, you know, I'm a little, we've been a little wary of making that public, frankly. Um, in the context of people debating whether they're going to extend care because I think whole, you know, culture wars then come into effect. But it's interesting to us that there's a big difference between the likelihood that young women who get pregnant who are in care, and this would pretty much be in Illinois, uh, are, are much more likely to choose to terminate their pregnancy 
than the young women who are out of care. The most of these women who are bringing those kids to term are single moms ending up living on public assistance with very little education. So I'll just throw that out there as you know, we need to think of this policy not just in terms of how do we meet the needs of the young people we're serving, obviously that's first and foremost, but also what effect does the policy actually have generally on human behavior and, and you know, what do we think about those changes in human behavior and, and our study suggests there's some pretty powerful impacts on human behavior around the issue of getting pregnant and what you do when what do you do once you are pregnant and so I would say as I as I briefly said up there you know we have evidence that extending care delays homelessness quite a bit by a few years but doesn't necessarily altogether prevent it um, now you know I guess as, as a parent of somebody who just turned 18 a few weeks ago you know the idea that that she would become homeless now we're not going that happen, right? But the idea that she would become homeless at 18 is much more troubling to me than she has some period of homelessness at 21. But hey, that's just me. Maybe it doesn't matter. Um, but again, I think delaying homelessness in some ways puts you in a position where you may hopefully got some other assets. The other thing I would say is that we have not drilled down into lengths of homeless spells, how many times young people are homeless with the rigor that we need to. So it may be that we're not just delaying homelessness, that we're actually having a significant impact on the length of homelessness, the, the chronicity, severity. Uh, frequency, severity. I can't really say anything about that yet. I want to turn to a second question that came in from the web audience, which relates uh, specifically about the trial independence piece in California, but knowing that Illinois has something under a different name but smelling just as sweet. Uh, I can ask both of you to attend to that question. Uh, the question is whether this is a costly process uh, when youth are out, return, the, the uh, petition process has to begin again, the court hearing. Uh, I guess the question really is uh, do we need to have that kind of process every time the youth returns? And implicit in the question is, is it a good idea to allow this type of um, trial and return policy? I'll take a stab at that first since we've been at it for a year. Uh, the answer would be yes. Um, in terms of cost, we're not finding it to be any cost, any more costly at all. When we implemented the law, one of the concerns, we actually called the law in Illinois, the downstate bill, because what we found that again, uh, uh, young people in Cook County, um, if they, indeed they were moving toward, you know, treating their plans and with the benchmarking and the advocacy, were staying in care up to age 21 or 19, 20 anyway, where we saw the large number of uh, discharges taking place or emancipations were in our college counties. And again, it was pretty much we had programs in those areas, but the young people were basically being emancipated out. When we implemented the law, because we didn't have any money, which was always our concern, there was no new money. We felt our existing funding for uh, all the youth programs could absorb it. To date, it has. We've had, I think, and I don't have the number in front of me, but I think we've probably had close to 80 or 90 youth who have actually come back. We've probably had maybe two to 300 calls from young people, and oftentimes, they don't always want to come back into service, but they want to know uh, they may have a particular immediate need and are looking for concrete resources in a, in a locale that they're in. So those have been the vast majority. And, and again, when they do come back, we try to do that through a, a contractual arrangement, you know, recognizing that with the young people that there will be certain expectations that we will want them to agree with. Because going back into a lot of our jurisdictions, you know, that's really there were some judges who don't like the law, you know, but, you know, our, our hope has been that we don't have kids currently being re-emancipated in, out and out because of, of not cooperation. What we're finding that many of them, after they have failed, have come back, you know, a little bit more motivated, again, to deal with a lot of the issues because I think what they find is, is once you're truly out there, and if you're out there and you don't have some support, you know, that I applaud the young people who then decide, hey, you know, I need to take advantage of those opportunities that are there. So I think it's a good law and it has not cost Illinois uh, any new money in order to do it. 
And I obviously can't speak to how much it's cost California because it hasn't been implemented yet in California. So we'll we'll have some experience with that starting in the new year. But I can tell you that we were very committed to including a reentry provision in AB 12. And it's for the same reasons that a priest was speaking to, which is we really want to have the opportunity for youth to try independence or to make mistakes or to leave and also know that they're able to come back. And it also goes to what Miller was speaking about, which is not every county in California does things the same way. There's 58 different counties, and really there, that means there's 58 different child welfare systems. And so needing to have the ability of youth to leave and to come back and to deal with that issue of sort of different perspectives um, to child welfare and different cultures in terms of discharging youth or encouraging youth to sort of leave, knowing and making sure that the youth know and that the youth are aware of their rights to come back into care if it's not working out the way that they had anticipated that it would work out. So we're very committed to it. I think there's a number of ways that states could achieve reentry or trial independence, and there was federal guidance that was issued in July of 2010 that outlines a number of different ways to actually go about allowing youth to come back into care or to remain in foster care beyond the age of 18. And it's worth reading that guidance because the the feds were very encouraging of flexibility and innovation and for states to really try to find whichever way works best for your state to take advantage of these options and to give young people these opportunities. So, you know, trial independence is the way we'd settled on it thus far in California, but I think there's a number of ways that it could actually be achieved that may fit within whatever cost structure uh, the state is dealing with. Priest, do you have a comment about this particular policy? Just a bit, just that it, the benefits of extending, of being in foster care until 21 are so huge, they will impact you for the rest of your life. And so if you don't, if you say you have to make that decision at 18 or 90 days prior to 18, and it's something that's going to affect you for the rest of your life, that's not something we ask of most people. So it seems strange to ask it of a population that really is at risk has been subjected to a lot of just inconsistency and hasn't really gotten a chance to get their sea legs or stand on their own two feet. So, I mean, that's my only reaction. Nicely put. Yeah, very good point. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience here? Uh, I'm Rich Cazola from uh, the Children and Family Practice Group at the Legal Assistance Foundation. Um, we do a lot of representation in DCFS cases and have a project starting uh, with some help from Dr. Courtney um, and his research uh, to help provide legal help to kids as they're aging out of foster care beyond the juvenile court. But this is a question for a pre's kind of talking about the systemic versus personal things. Um, the voices that you had on the other end of the line, I mean, it's tempting for me to say, oh, you j just must have been either lucky or had really good relationships or something like that. Was there anything? that happened when you were in care that helped facilitate, you know, that helped make that happen? Like, why were those people there at the other end of the line? Was it just blind luck, or was it, did something happen in care that, that helped that happen? I think primarily it was two things. One, I have a sister who is a lot like me. She was also a Foster Club All-Star. She's currently in her first year of law school at NYU. Um, and we really we supported each other. So that was the one thing. I had someone who was at my level supporting me, and we worked through it together. Also, um, Foster Club, which was the internship that I did when I was 18 and that my sister did when she was 18, provided a basic level of support. It provided a connection, community, um, and it also taught me how to maneuver the system. So. I mean, really, I was lucky. I was lucky to be able to meet great people and to have opportunities like this that really benefited me. Um, and then also, I am motivated. I want to succeed. You know, Im implicit in that question is what's the meaning of the title of the law? Fostering connections with whom? Mm -hmm. uh, it is a connection to the system, obviously. But I don't know, Angie, how in California are you thinking about the policy or practice support for fostering connections of these youth to others. And one of our central goals in California and as uh, front and center of a lot of these discussions is how to make those permanent connections to other caring adults and what that is going to mean in terms of real policy. And again, we don't have 
these answers yet in California. These are things that are in discussion. They're things that we're requiring of ourselves through the legislation. So we actually put that into the statute um, and said, this is one of the things that has to be front and center in the transitional independent living plans that we'll be developing and that the court will be checking in on every six months as youth continue on in extended care, that those permanent connections are one of the main goals of the TILP. So how do we do that? How do we actually achieve that in practice? I mean, some of that is to be seen, but it's certainly something that is on the top of our minds. Mark. You know, I'll take that to make my pitch that some people have probably heard before. Um, even if even if young people were in care 10 years, in a lot of states they wouldn't necessarily have been in care on average that long, and even in Illinois it's an average, right? Um, many of these young people aging out have very strong connections to their family. Um, even if their family, even if they would tell you, quote unquote, you know, one of the young people I you know, studied, my family is a mess. Of course, my daughter would probably say that on the right occasion. Um, and in fact, in the Midwest study, three quarters of young people in our study would, would tell you at any point in time, didn't matter whether it's 17, 19, 20, that hasn't changed really. I am close or very close to at least, and we ask about different members of their family, to an adult member of my family, not counting you know, siblings, right? And lots of contact with family. I mean, 60% of these young people talk to their mom like I'm just glad my mom's never been in the audience when I share my you know <laughs> research on how often they talk to their moms on average because I didn't do that you know when I left left home so there's there's a lot of contact there and and I think one of the things as a system we kind of set ourselves up and if you think about the whole permanency planning process and everything and you get past reunification as a permanency goal you basically have a whole bunch of professionals who think they're the kids family and for understandable reasons, why we go into the field, these families, you know, in some ways weren't there for them. But nevertheless, as they make the transition to adulthood, most of them not only, you know, have to, but want to manage their relations with these, with these folks. And I think it's just really important for us to honor that mm -hmm. and in a way that allows us to co-parent. I mean, one of the you know, things I like to say is in some ways that's what fostering connections is doing is the federal government is saying you have permission to co-parent and the co-parents is all kinds of people it's it's all the adults in the system it's adults in other systems the healthcare systems etc I, mean, I think we really need to think of it that way but we're also doing that in in most cases with members of their extended family and i think our policies and practices and attitudes need to embrace that you know i would i would ditto that because one of the things that uh, we know is that even young people in our TLPs and independent living programs, they're going home. You know, let's, let's not fool ourselves. And, and I think that as a system, and we're engaged in that, when I look at our policies, for example, we know that we have, because of permanency, terminated a lot of parental rights. And guess what? Those kids are still going right back to see their parents and their family. We do not terminate relationships. And so I think the biggest misnomer that we've seen and what we see with our older youth is, is that many of them, their cases have been, parental rights have been terminated, their goal has been changed to independence, <laughs> we're moving them toward independence, and they still have a family that they connect to. And so we're really trying to, and it's a practice issue as much as a policy issue, to really begin to look at how we get our staff in these programs to really do family engagement. And you know, and I think we've done a lot of talk in our industry about family engagement, but it isn't happening. I, I read too many UIRs, kid is on run this week, well, where did he go home? <laughs> <laughs> so is he really on run? And so I think that, you know, we have to really begin to look at moving away, as we're gonna try to do in Illinois, to move away from a simply child-centered service system for all the kids to really begin to look at embracing families. Uh, one of the things that has happened is, is we have had a new law to restore parental rights because I think one of the things we all realize is that where a kid may have been at age five to 10 and where he is at 19 or 20 and how he views his family and the issues there are, are a heck of a lot different and so we need to, to remain relevant. And, and I think we've learned that because of what we've seen not only from our data but what we hear from our kids. And, and one of the things that I know that they have a foster club that we don't call it that here. I love different states. We all got different acronyms for the same thing. But we have a very strong youth advisory board. 
and we're really looking at encouraging and getting more young people throughout the state involved in those boards to not only meet as young people to deal with issues and strategies, but also to meet with folks like us, to meet with our directors so we can also, you know, hear from what's going on with our kids. Because you don't always know how your policy is impacting sitting in the office. You really got to hear from young people who are going through our systems to, to make us better at what we do. We have time, I think, for one more question from the audience, if we have it. If not, I know I have one. Uh, but Diane, do you want to take the last opportunity? Yeah. I'm Diane Redley from the Family Defense Center, which is an uh, independent, not-for-profit legal advocacy organization in Chicago. I was really impressed by your data about participation of the youth in the study, and I wondered if talking to the kids and doing the study has influenced the way you think people should be getting information about their decisions um, and, and influencing the practice, because I think that the whole system isn't very good at that, and maybe you could enlighten us on how to improve talking to kids. Well, I mean, I would say, I mean, in defense of the system, um, you know, we, we do have the luxury of coming to the young people um, and not being the system, right? I mean, we're, we're talking to them confidentially and we're from the university and, you know, I think that, that that gives them an opportunity to tell us some things that they wouldn't necessarily tell any professional who said, you know, I want to ask you this. Because we ask some pretty sensitive questions. That being said, I, I would say that going all the way back to Trudy Festinger's study in like 1978, you know, where she, and I, I still use questions from that study, like I feel lucky to have been in foster care, people in foster care are looking out for me. Questions that, that get at how well young people are being served by the system. We've been asking them for 30 years and she got a 90-something percent response rate at baseline, I think, in her study. Um, and the title of her book was No One Ever Asked Us. And I think that kind of sums it up, is that it really is a practice issue that <coughs> if uh, we, and the we is a lot of different folks, it's caseworkers, it's folks working in, in provider agencies, it's attorneys, you know, it's judges, uh, get in the habit of asking young people, what do you think, you know, what do you need, how's it going, they'll tell you. Um, now that being said, I, I actually think that our, our studies in some ways an argument for consumer satisfaction surveys you know, if you might want to call them that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, done of young people in the system by folks who aren't from the system. You know, they don't need to be as extensive as what, what we do, but there's something to be said for that. Um, probably something to be said for doing that with parents engaged in the I know you would be sympathetic to that, man. But um, I don't think there's a rocket science to it. I think it's just deciding that that's important and looking for what are the right opportunities and venues in which you can seek their input. And sometimes it's at the individual level, sometimes it's groups, you know, sometimes getting young people together is a better way to, to engage them than it is talking to them individually. But um, we can do it, we just have to decide we want to do it. Uh, again, there's not, I don't think there's any great rocket science to it, unless if you're asking them questions where they can feel like the person asking them is in a position to influence the help they get, services they get, or something like that, then that's probably not a great idea. You, you probably need to figure out a way to have somebody ask those questions in a way that they know that that's not going to come back to haunt them. I would just add to that, although it's not completely directly responsive to your question, but again, in California, we're very uh, aware of the need to have youth engaged at every level of this process. And I spoke a little bit about how active youth are in Sacramento and the legislature and sharing their stories and being involved in the development of these policies. But as we've gone about implementing AB 12, we have put together a number of youth councils um, in order to vet with them what we've come up with in these meetings and basically say, are we getting it right? What do you think? Would this actually work for you? Would you sign this mutual agreement? Do you understand this mutual agreement? <laughs> you know, what about what we're coming up with for supervised independent living placements. Like, is this something that works for you or wouldn't work for you? So we're trying to be proactive in terms of designing the policies at getting those opinions and asking those questions before we ever put the final version on the books. And we're sort of 
you know, at least temporarily stuck with the structure that we've created to have the youth part of the process of implementing. So again, it's not completely responsive, but I think it's another way of engaging youth and making them part of the process and feel like they have a real voice in what the ultimate design of our programs is, which can ultimately lead, I think, to better practice. Thank you, and I think uh, that those last few sentences are a great place uh, to end today. I'd like to thank our panel as well as our web audience and our audience here in Chicago for taking the time to discuss what is a timely and important issue. I uh, appreciate your participation in Thursday's Child and look forward to your participation in future events. Thanks.